I am um, so honored to be here with all of you today. And I should tell you right away that the gift of an invitation to address a seminary audience fills this PK preacher kid's heart very full. Um, <clears throat> So we've come together today <clears throat> to talk about poverty, trauma, and mental health. And I could not do justice to the start of that conversation without noting the moment in which we happen to be meeting one another. In recent days, we have all felt the mighty pain of watching the suffering of our neighbors in Ukraine. They seem so near in a world where we are now accustomed to being a global digital family just as we have been vulnerable to a global family pandemic. These days we are proximate, even if digitally, to so many people in extremis, which by light of the digital dictionary means in an extremely difficult situation or at the point of death. For all of us, these past two years have been at minimum disruptive and isolating. For most of us, we have felt some degree of depression. For our children and youth, these years have derailed them from developmental necessities and a sense of basic safety. And for some of us and our loved ones, we have been, or perhaps we have felt, at the point of death. Add that to our pre-existing conditions. Decades of declining mental health indicators amongst the general population, an opioid epidemic out of control, rising social inequity, including the echo of old conversations about who even gets to participate equally. Just who is included in the definition of us? Social inclusion and equity are being hotly debated these days. Mental health is being openly discussed, and we are witness to the emergence of a promising new movement for racial justice. I take these all as hopeful signs. Change is stirring. And to back up our long-standing intuitions, we now have the science to demonstrate that poverty and trauma have predictably negative and disproportionate impacts on the mental health of communities of color, the impoverished, the queer identified, and other others. We even have the science to back up our intuitions about the conditions necessary to thrive, and we know what happens when people are deprived of them. We know the conditions necessary to flourish, we know the conditions necessary just to breathe. So with all the pain and injustice and uncertainty of our times, there is a temptation. Well, I should say I confess myself to feeling the temptation to flee or to freeze, as we would say in clinical terms. It can be easy to imagine that we are powerless in the face of so much human suffering. How can I matter? How can we make the difference we intend? The suggestion I offer you this morning is, we hope and we go together. We hold on to hope with a capital H and we act for justice together. By hope, I do not mean something fluffy or hallmarky. I mean hope as our necessary and renewable source of collective power. Hope is something we can and we must generate together and something we must give away to keep the flow of its power going. This power is necessary to see where we are going and to achieve our ultimate ambitions for ourselves, for our neighbors, for all of the us over time. And the preacher's kid in me wants to add that although at this age in my life, I'm decidedly an interfaithy person, I was cooked in the Christian tradition, 
So this season of Lent seems a particularly good time to meditate both on those things which plague us and on the promise of renewal and recovery. So if you're willing, as a spark for our day of meaningful conversation, I'd like to take you along the path of my own story of awakening, my story of being proximate to issues of poverty and trauma and the social forces which bind them together for worse and for better. In my story, we'll travel from inner city Baltimore to downtown Washington, DC, then finally home to New York. Essentially, we'll be traveling the Amtrak corridor east. But for those of you who like to get grounded in data first, I've got your ticket to ride. Consider these statistics. In 2020, people living below the federal poverty line were 41% more likely to have a mental health condition and 93% more likely to have a substance use condition. Children living in poverty are almost 70% more likely to have a mental health condition and adolescent mental health problems almost double the odds of being unemployed in adulthood. ACEs, early life trauma, more than double the odds of developing conditions like depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. People with mental health and substance use conditions are four to six times more likely to be victims of violence. 75% of people experiencing homelessness are estimated to have a mental health or substance use condition. And finally, here's the result of an interesting recent study. Cash payments alone given to mothers living in poverty increased toddler brain activity. I give all the credit there to the data gurus at Mental Health America and can provide citations for, uh, for those of you as you wish. So with that smattering of data in mind, onward to the Amtrak corridor east which begins in West Baltimore in the early aughts. It was a place of the deepest poverty I had ever seen. A black and brown community left behind and surgically divided from the whiter city by a highway, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. At the time, I was working for Johns Hopkins and my job was to establish mental health programs for children and families in inner city Head Start schools. Also at the time, The Wire was becoming a big hit on HBO and was sometimes being filmed in the neighborhoods where I was spending my time. On those same streets were permanently parked white police vans with giant antennas extending upwards which cradled cameras and blazing lights to bathe the city streets overnight. There was only one supermarket in a dense area and it had a caged entrance. Liquor stores were on most of the corners. The school that was my home base was a trailer placed unceremoniously inside a fenced asphalt lot which flowered every morning with orange syringe caps. And from the stoops of the boarded row houses across the street, men's voices called out the color code names of the drugs they had for sale. Blue, red, other. Inside, the schools were the busy worlds of women, teachers and mothers mostly, their classrooms were often chaotic and distressed, but there were also joyful moments. Singing time was a favorite, or better said, shouting time for some of the young musical enthusiasts. Occasionally, there were fathers around, but the absence of men was conspicuous, and it was arresting to hear how casually the women talked about fathers and brothers locked up. For a long time there, I felt embarrassed by my insufficiency. They needed a 30-something white social worker peddling mental health about as much as they needed another psychosocial interview about their personal problems. No doubt, the individual mental health needs in those communities were undeniably huge. But it might have been better to send in a culturally reflective peer counselor to the hair salon than, say, 
with me. More than anything clinical, or more than anything even charitable, that community needed justice. They needed accessible and healthy food. They needed fewer children with lead poisoning from decayed substandard housing. They needed real educational opportunity. They needed out of poverty. That was my first stop on the awakening ride, and that felt like a hopeless terrain. It reminded me of this quote from James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time as he reflects on his early life in 1950s Harlem. There seemed to be no way whatever to remove this cloud that stood between them and the sun, between them and love and life and power, between them and whatever it was they wanted. One did not have to be very bright to realize how little one could do to change one's situation. One did not have to be abnormally sensitive to be worn down to a cutting edge by the incessant and gratuitous humiliation and danger one encountered every day, all day long. What I eventually learned there was not to do my job. I could clearly see that the higher calling each day was to neglect the Medicaid forms, to the distress of my employer, and simply to accompany and to befriend and to bear witness. I got close to several women whom I'll never forget. Some were the guardians and warriors of the community, and some were the fallen or falling. One true heroine was beloved Aunt Gloria, the unemployed and overtly trans woman whose secret was never discussed, but whose daily presence as a volunteer classroom parent was a necessary anchor for us all. If anyone there was dispensing mental health services, it was Aunt Gloria. Befriending and bearing witness is half the battle, and the other half is acting on what we know to act for justice and well-being in every way we know, to tell others what we have seen, to listen and follow the lead of the most affected and afflicted, and to advocate with them and for them. The next stop on my awakening train takes place near Thomas Circle in Washington, D.C. Before arriving at Mental Health America, for 17 years, I belonged to a community called N Street Village. I still belong, in a sense, though I no longer work there as the CEO. Our mission was to prevent and end homelessness for the most vulnerable women in our region, one person at a time. We provided shelter, literal and figurative. We were safe haven from the damages done by so many things, poverty, trauma, ill mental health, addiction. Sorry for that, let me turn off my notes. And beyond the basics of emergency shelter, we also provided home, also literal and figurative. Good housing in healthy neighborhoods, and the warm indoors of connection and relationship. Daily, we were witness to suffering. I often think of Queenie, who at 62 was shocked to find herself in a shelter while still employed as a school administrative assistant after decades in that job. But her rent had gone up and her wages had stayed flat for too many years until the day the eviction notice appeared. When I first met her, she chased me down the hall after exchanging a greeting to reinforce a message in the crowded hallway. This isn't me, she said. And daily, we were also witness to extraordinary examples of resilience and healing. What the organization could provide were the conditions for hope, including the intangible basics, the extension of radical welcome, the warm greeting that conveyed our certainty of the inherent worth and dignity of every woman we met. 
On those evenings when I went upstairs to one of the group apartments, the kitchen's fragrance would rush to greet me, and once inside for a visit, even if I were protested that I was just there to say hello, I would be fed. There was no leaving before sharing a meal. Dinner time was sort of a happy hostage situation. Hope was a living thing at the village, and daily I witnessed healing and recovery happen in community, powered and recycled by the authentic connections which regenerated and exchanged hope every day. From each according to their ability, to each according to their need. One day I was walking into the day center and encountered a loud scene. Sharon, who had just arrived from jail two weeks earlier, was in a lobby chair crying, angrily repeating that she just wanted to leave, she just wanted to go home. She was surrounded in a semicircle of her peers. One was holding her hand in silence, and another, Yvette, stood over her and lectured. The doors are open, Sharon. You can leave any time, but I know you want this more. That magic was not for a therapist's office, nor was it for me to interrupt. This was community performing its own instinctive healing. A few days later, I was walking out of the courtyard on my way to a meeting, feeling unusually irritated about something so unimportant it has long faded in memory. I was walking fast and looking at my feet when I heard someone say, girl, pick that head up. And I looked up to see Sharon walking toward me, to each according to their need. Her precision generosity included a warm hug, and my job that day was just to receive her kindness. In healing community, I learned that receiving and giving exist in vital balance. We all need the opportunity to give of what we have, like Yvette to Sharon, like Sharon to me. To be of service to one another is healing to the spirit for all of us, no exceptions. And everyone has something to give. And on the flip side, to be seen or treated as only worthy of being recipients of others' charity is disempowering to the spirit. I dare to guess by our chance presence here together today that every one of us in some way understands that we ourselves have been nourished and healed in service to the other. I imagine I'm preaching to the choir. Community even taught me to face the dark matters in my own mental health, my own spiritual health. Amongst communities of the recovering, I found the wisdom to understand my own trauma in a new and non-judgmental way and I found the courage to acknowledge and address my own unhealed wounds. In a very real sense, I was changed for good by belonging to that community at Thomas Circle in Washington, DC. There is one last stop on the Amtrak Corridor East, and this one takes place in New York City. This story is my last because it is my proof of hope writ large. Proof of hope from our history and for our collective future. It is a story of a whole community's healing and recovery, but only over time, and only with the acceptance of the sorrows and the injustices of the past, and with actions taken in hope of a better tomorrow. The story starts in 1969, the year of the Stonewall Riots, a defining moment for gay liberation. That year, a young Methodist minister made the difficult decision to turn in his collar and abandon that calling for another to come out as himself. It was both a self-exile and a self-liberation. He divorced a wife he loved and lost his primary family ties. He began to struggle with depression and substance abuse. He tried therapy and was met with a friendly conversion attempt. 
he stopped going to therapy. The shame he had absorbed never overcame his doubt. He had little hope for his soul. 20 years later, he died of AIDS while living in a Christian shelter in Times Square and having spent the last years of his life repenting the sin of being gay and praying that he might be saved. He was even employed by certain groups and churches to preach on the topic of dying for his sins. His material impoverishment at the end was not intergenerational, but it was in part the result of societal exclusion. The losses he endured, the mental ill health that followed, and then an epidemic. I am that preacher's kid. I am the child of Reverend Thomas Stribling. I was witness to, and in some ways took part in, his many struggles. Depression, substance abuse, a suicide attempt, a drunk driving accident, time at Rikers Island, time in a homeless shelter, and the thing which brought us closest, his early death. In my life, this has been the impact of intergenerational trauma. I saw more and experienced more than my tender age could bear. And I've had to learn to recover from the long tentacles of that trauma. But here's the amazing hope in my story. By contrast, even though my father and I are separated by only one generation, 25 years, my experience as an out queer person has been largely, almost entirely, one of social inclusion. I have scarcely ever been in a situation where I felt I had to hide my identity. And I've been out, that is to say, I've been myself, since I was a teenager. In one generation, we've gone from stonewall riots to legalized gay marriage. That's a case for hope. I have a case for hope. I wish my father could have known that a new movement for healing and reconciliation was just beginning as he was ending. I wish he could have seen the small parades of the 1970s blossom into whole Junes of gay pride celebration. And just to confirm, I don't mean to suggest that LGBTQ individuals and communities are no longer in distress. We are watching rising suicide rates, anti-trans rights legislation, and fresh data which tell a very different story. We have a long way to go, and our young queer community is in distress. So we must continue to hope for more progress, and I do. In fact, I believe you might say, I have faith. Progress is possible if we have an imagination for where we are going and if we work for it together. We hold on to hope and we go together. All of us others go together. In America today, I believe that the most extreme public mental health emergencies we face are poverty and racial injustice. We know from the data and from our own moral compass that they are directly linked to poor individual outcomes. They are linked to pain and danger in real people's lives. As anyone in recovery will tell you, acknowledging that we have a problem is the first step. And the second step is that we become willing to do something about it. So that's my journey on the Amtrak Corridor East, from points of devastation in Baltimore, drowning in trauma and loss, then on to DC and discovering the lessons of community, and finally backwards in history to the lessons of hope and action and time and the real potential of our continued human evolution towards social equity and recovery. Hope is our necessary and renewable source of power, 
It powers our progress, and it must be shared to become sustainable. Please receive my gratitude for the opportunity to be of service with you today, I hope. <laughs> and I honor your good works, and I will hold you in my very interfaithy prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I have learned so much about Hoosier hospitality. And this is a city filled with people of faith. We have a vibrant interfaith community. We have a strong philanthropic community, and we love this city. And we believe working together with Faith in Action and other partners that we can end the cycle of poverty, which you so eloquently tied to breaking the silence about mental illness and that connection between mental health challenges and poverty. While we love our city, we know we face great challenges. And so we've invited everyone here today to help us think through how do we help our community break that cycle of poverty? And we know in our beautiful city, we also face high levels of gun violence. And we also have high levels of poor health outcomes and high rates of suicide in Indiana. And so thank you for helping us dig deeply into how poverty is connected to mental health. And as we begin our conversation, I'd like to invite you to um, expand on your comments about what you learned working in the field. And from, was it Aunt Gloria, who you set aside your paperwork and you realized that your role there was to witness and to befriend. So many people here today and watching are in the community. We are in the trenches. We are doing the work, whether we're pastors, faith leaders, working with nonprofits, or working in government organizations. And so how can we not add a new program, but integrate a trauma-informed and mental health-informed approach to what we are already doing. We're already feeding people who are hungry. We're already uh, raising donations, gathering food for food banks. We already have tutoring programs, and we're already helping people find housing and transitional housing. So instead of maybe adding new programming, how can we bring what you're talking about into the work that we're already doing? First of all, thank you again for the invitation to talk about this and, and to be here and to be in Indianapolis. It is really a pleasure and a pleasure to meet all of you. And I do know that you all are already doing so much of this good work in your communities and I um, commend you for that and I am grateful to be uh, in community with you this morning um, as people who, are, who care deeply about these things. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the issue of trauma, for one thing. Um, I think that for the work that, what I, one of the things that I learned in my own journey that I was talking about really was ultimately to bring a, uh, in our trauma-informed lens, to bring what I came to think of as a universal precautions approach to this. In, in, when we think back to the early days of the AIDS epidemic, that's what we, those were our, that was our term for, before we knew how transmission worked, universal precautions was just making the assumption that everyone might be sick. Yeah. And with regard to trauma, what we really learned, what I learned in community at N Street Village and what I certainly experienced in Baltimore was to have an expectation that everyone was had probably been exposed to some form of trauma, even if it was just living in the housing conditions that people were in, or living in poverty for any length of time. Um, so I think that's a that's a promising, a promising practice, if you will, or a posture that is important to bring to our work is the sense of universal precaution. So what does that mean? It, in part, it means even welcoming people with the, in ways that we know are important for people who've experienced poverty, to be accessible, to be hospitable, to offer dignity to people, to be very careful about um, how we invite people into telling their own stories. 
so that it's we're not intrusive, but we're open. And to signal in whatever ways we can in the environment that we are open to this, to a conversation not just about trauma, but about mental health. Um, I think back also to the days when we used to have uh, stickers around that meant so much, and I remember them starting in schools, about safe space for LGBTQ folks, the circle triangle stickers that we put everywhere. Um, so there are ways in, in our, e even in the visual cues of our environments, but also in the way that, that we speak to one another and in what we choose to speak about, that we indicate that we are not only against stigma, but to the best of our ability, we are a, a, an unstigmified community, that we welcome conversations about mental health, that we know that mental health is health, and we know that it is central to everyone's experience, and we want those conversations to, uh, to continue. The other thing your question makes me think about is that as I was talking about in my remarks, I think it's so important for people who are on the receiving end of so many things, whether it's going to a food bank or going to the welfare office or go to get your food stamps. If you've ever had to do any of those things, you know, it, back to the James Baldwin quote, it is a humiliating experience for many. Um, so I think when we understand what it is like to always be the recipient, it's also important to figure out how do we offer people opportunities to give of what they have? Because they do have something to give, whether it's their kindness, their warmth and friendship. Aunt Gloria is a perfect example. Um, she had a lot to give, <laughs> um, as did many others. And so figuring out where it is in, that people can be a, become a peer counselor or maybe be an anchor for a group of other folks who are going through something similar. I think it's very important to imagine where we can build opportunities for empowerment and, and spiritual health or mental health. I love that idea that you've shared with us about uh, universal precautions and that assumption that most everyone who is here and who we see and work with has had some kind of trauma or had some kind of experience of a mental health challenge in their own personal lives or someone they love. I think the data today, uh, NAMI used to say it's one in five people is living with a mental health challenge. Now it's two out of five, and I think it's higher than that. So that idea of, of just entering into your conversations, being sensitive, and looking for how we can open the door for mental health conversations. And I love that idea of a sticker. And I wonder if that's something we could try. If we could, someone here who's creative in graphic design, design a sticker for us that we can share and, and put on the door to say we welcome conversations about mental health. Thank you so much for those great ideas. And your story today about the places along uh, your train uh, ride, but also the story that you shared personally and the power of personal stories to help uh, dismantle stigma and to break the silence. Thank you for sharing that with us. In my work around mental health with faith communities, um, I also encourage storytelling as a way to really get to the heart of the matter and to create safe space to share. But a question I hear a lot, and I want to ask you, is whether you're a preacher in the pulpit, a different kind of faith leader, or um, a different kind of city le leader or clinician, what is the role of personal testimony or story and um, how would you advise people to navigate that if they haven't shared before about their own personal history of trauma or mental health challenge? What suggestions would you offer to someone who feels ready to share but not quite sure how to do it? That's, thank you for that question. It's, it's so, such an interesting question. For one thing, for those of us who have been trained in the helping professions, I I'm a social worker, and for those of you who are pastors or clinicians, et cetera, part of the training has often been about having this very rigid boundary around not sharing personally, that somehow it, it was going to um, 
pollute your ability to help someone. And I've come to think very differently about that because I actually think that it is a further way, a, a rather, another way in which we dismiss or negate or disenfranchise other people or make them other than us. As you said at the beginning, two in five, two, I forget the statistic, but let's take the lifetime statistic. 50% of us will experience some form of a, of a di diagnosable mental health condition. So let's say 100% of us will either, either ourselves or a loved one, a close loved one. So it, mental health will touch us all and mental health is fundamental to everything about our lives. I mean, even watching the situation in Ukraine for now, um, this, we're, we can't help but think about the mental health consequences for the people who are experiencing it, for those of us who are witnessing it, for our children and youth watching a world on fire with that, with climate change, with everything else. So um, I think it's really, I'm going on a tangent, sorry, you can reel me in. Um, but I, I think that telling our own personal stories, I've, I've wrestled a little bit with where the line is, because I do think there's a line in part for ourselves and our own well-being, and we have to find what that is. But we have to walk up to the line in order to really meet people where they are and to say, I am no different than you. And that, to me, seems fundamental to our ability to really make progress, really empower communities, really help people. You know, I may happen to be the one giving out the bag in the food pantry, but I am no different from you, and I have a story too. And being willing to share our stories to the, to the right degree for us, I mean, there's plenty more about my mental health autobiography that I don't tell, but the, the parts that I can tell and do, I think it's, it's important that that vulnerability and openness says we are all humans in this together. And I appreciate in your telling of that, you referenced your own healing and your own recovery work. And so in your storytelling, you model that you've worked on yourself, you've taken time uh, to heal. And so that's a beautiful way to share the story, to offer an example of how others can find hope and healing. So thank you. We are at Christian Theological Seminary. This is the Faith in Action Project. So to talk about the role of faith and mental health in your powerful story about your father, the Reverend Thomas Stribling, we remember him and honor him today with you. And also to say that faith is known to be a protective factor. There's some great research about the power of faith communities, the power of prayer, the power of having hope that you're not alone, that God loves you and that things can get better. But we also know that tragically sometimes faith and faith communities can be a risk factor for mental health challenges. And so in your story, I heard that. And you referenced that there was um, some impacts from society, the, the um, perceptions of society that harmed your father. But I also want to name, as a pastor, that the perceptions of the faith community and the Christian community harmed your father. And so I would like to offer an apology. I am sorry for the harm that was done to your father and to you, and to so many, too many people. Please forgive us. Thank you. Um, that means a lot to me. And, and it's very, very true, very true. Um, no doubt my father um, was, was harmed by a faith to which he felt a true calling, and, and it's a, that's a deep sadness. Um, and it's also true that, as you say, faith and faith communities can be a tremendous protective factor. And one of the concerns that we have at Mental Health America, we were just talking about that, the, that this week, 
it for is for youth, and we and we're so concerned right now about the youth mental health crisis, and something that we're actively working on is how how much disconnection there is now from place faith communities and of all types, places where people gather to be in community, to be in connection with one another, to be in equitable connection with one another and to be in connection with something of meaning and purpose. And so we've of course had decades of decline in, in terms of people's affiliation with faith communities, but in part because there were harms done. Um, and so I think the next generation has some, has good rationale in some ways for disconnection. At the same time, Time now we layer on top a pandemic which has way disconnected us all that much more, and social media which has entered our children's lives in a way that can be both connecting and way disconnecting, um, and so I th that that's a concern going forward is how do we harness the new protective factors and how do we lift up communities of true inclusion where healing can really happen for people. So now that we know better, we know that Christian teachings uh, can harm, especially at-risk youth, LGBTQ youth. Uh, we can do better. And so I invite all of us to make that pledge. Now that we know better, we can do better. Because there is a need for healing in our communities. And so thank you for leading us in that journey of healing. Um, when you talk about the risk factors of our children and youth, what advice would you have for those of us serving youth in our communities? What's something practical that we can do to support youth mental health? I think perhaps the most important thing is to listen to them, is to ask them and listen to them and really hear what their experience is and what their stories are. Youth are not always at the table and they often, we actually held a meeting this week on a, a national youth mental health crisis that we're leading at Mental Health America and we had some youth presenters who talked about the, the pain and aggravation of being excluded from so many decision making tables and the, uh, I think we need to remember our nothing about us without us commitment. So first of all, we listen to them and we understand their experiences and I think also we make space for them to gather and we normalize what they're going through. The, not that anything about the past two years in our lives has been normal, but the mental health response and the mental health effects of it are happening to many, many people. And it's, I think it's very important for us to let ourselves and everyone know that this is not unexpectable. I think we can take a question or two from the audience. And so if you'd like to prepare the questions, we'll, we'll turn to that. I want to follow up on a data point you shared. And if you have any more background about um, how giving mothers more financial resources improves the brain activity of children. Isn't that fascinating? So that was a recent study that came out which was be around, I think this was testing the notion that um, uh, around the uh, child tax credit, that there was a study done at Columbia that, I think it was Columbia, I'll double check that, that showed that cash payments alone to mothers increased their toddler's brain activity. Now there was no uh, conclusion there, but I think we probably all of us would come to the same intuition about that, which is that a mother who is less concerned about her security, her daily well-being, her ability to feed that child, is going to have more emotional availability for bonding. And bonding is the thing, of course, which stimulates growth and children in children's brains and in their whole development. So invest in mothers. Invest in mothers. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 
Our first uh, question from the audience is, I work almost daily with returning citizens, 90% or more of which have suffered from trauma or PTSD. What advice can you give to persuade them to get some form of therapy and then to continue with it over an extended period of time? Such a great question. Thank you for that, and thank you for your work, whomever um, uh, put that in. I, I can only give you, refer back to what I learned at, at, at Street Village and what I learned in community, which is that sometimes we, we can persuade people, and part of that is about establishing a trusting relationship, an authentic relationship where people feel that they can be open, signaling our non-stigma posture, signaling that we, that trauma is understood and that there are ways, that there is help and that there is treatment. I do think that's an important message in something at Mental Health America we think about a lot, that there are effective interventions to help people. They are not all about therapists always, or therapist offices, and very often they're about peers um, as well. And that, to me, is really the strong connection, that when people can be in community with one another, that there's a, there's a certain healing that can happen there. I think we can provide the conditions for that, and to the best of our ability, if we can provide places where people gather, where these topics can be opened up between and amongst the people who have a shared experience where there's a great deal of safety, and where there is some hope. Because as one person begins to heal, as one person begins to recover, that is a true inspiration to the person who's just arriving from jail. You know, maybe I could be like her. Um, and so I think that cycle, um, that continuous cycle is really so important. I love that emphasis on peer support, and you talked earlier about befriending people. Mental illness is often referred to as a non-casserole illness. We don't bring casseroles to people who are in bed with depression for days or just out of the psychiatric hospital. And one of the faith leaders I worked with, he said, the best thing that churches can do for mental health is to have potlucks. And so if you think about the power of breaking isolation, reminding people they are not alone, that they belong to a community that cares for them, and this idea of creating spaces for peer-to-peer -peer support, to drinking coffee together, you know, having a casserole or a hot dish, wherever, uh, whichever part of the country you're from. I think investing back in those core relationships that show honor and dignity of one another is a, is a beautiful way forward with hope. I, I so agree. And you know, mental illness should be a casserole illness. You, we, you know, if I'm depressed, uh, I, I hope you'll bring me a casserole. <laughs> um, but th there is something, that's one of the ways that we signal normalizing and we signal our commitment to anti-stigma uh, posture. Um, this is, uh, Peers are definitely important, having people with shared relationships. But anything that establishes that kind of human-to-human -human kindness and the understanding that the other person is in suffering and that we can be, we're not afraid to sit with them in that. As we wrap up our time together, I would I'd like to hear from you the, the takeaway uh, for, for all of us. Um, as I think about uh, preachers and faith leaders and other leaders in the city um, who have a platform or a pulpit to share a message, um, so many times we're not talking about mental health openly. But if those in this room and those listening could have a message to share from a pulpit or from their lectern or platform, what would you hope that message would be? Very straightforward. I hope that that message would start by talking about the fact that mental, our mental health has been impacted by these past few years, all of us together. That mental health in its broad rainbow of expressions affects everyone. That, in just speaking the words, is a way to say this is a place of safety. 
This is a place where we don't hold stigma. And the other thing I would say is to share your story. Share your story and share the stories of others who are willing for their, share, their stories to be shared or invite them. Invite them to the pulpit or invite them to the at coffee hour afterwards to share their stories. Thank you so much. I love how you talked about hope as our collective power. And so thank you for filling us with your hope. And I hope all of you here have been inspired and encouraged and uh, be emboldened to break the silence. Use your lecture and your pulpit, your platform to say the words mental health, to share your stories, and to join this movement for mental health justice for all. Thank you so much for your so time much. with us. Thank you.